join us for an interview with Melinda Metz. But Melinda, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Well, to get things started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got into writing for our readers that might be new to you? Sure. Um, well, it feels like it started so long ago now. <laughs> now when, uh, after I graduated from college, I moved to New York and I wanted to work in publishing. And after a couple of years, I got a job as an editorial assistant and I kind of moved from being an editor to gradually wanting to write. And then um, almost my very first writing assignment, it was a writer for hire project um, for the book series Roswell High, which then became the TV show um, Roswell. And then much later became rebooted as Roswell, New Mexico which seems so strange that I'm old enough to have something that was rebooted, but <laughs> it's true. And then um, I wrote a lot of young adult things, sometimes with um, Laura Burns, uh, who was my editor on Roswell, on Roswell High. And then together we worked on the TV show for a season and we worked on another show called 1-800-MISSING. And then um, I'm trying to think, I guess about six years ago, um, Gary Goldstein, who is my current editor, we were both editors together at Berkeley Publishing back in the late 80s. <laughs> and he had read an article about a cat who was stealing things and leaving them at his person's doorstep. And he, um, he said he wanted like a kind of romantic comedy based on this and he wanted to know if I wanted to do it. And so um, I told him I would like to try it. And uh, that kind of kicked off this whole um, kind of light romance with animal subplot. Um, so I did three with the cat and then three with this fox. So that's the, yeah. There's so much I want to unpack with you because when I was doing research and, and familiar with some of your work, um, I was like, okay, where do I even start with everything? <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with Roswell. Okay. I was a fan of the shows and everything. And like you said, what is it like having not only writing the books for it, but having it be optioned and making it to TV, which so many authors don't get that, and then having it rebooted. And both of those versions being such hits uh, with the fans. It's so rare because um, first it, it just gets narrow and narrower, like very few books get optioned. And then out of those, only a certain number get the pilot script written. And then out of those, only a certain number get the pilot actually filmed. And then of those, only a certain number of the pilots make it onto the air. And then in those, you know, very few even still make it multiple episodes. So it felt very surreal and surprising and shocking because as I said, it was really very close. I think the only thing I'd written before that was a novelization of the Goosebumps TV show that was already based on a Goosebumps book. So it was a novelization of a TV show based on a book already. So I was just, it was shorter than the original Goosebumps and followed the TV script and it had pictures from the TV show. So it was, I, it would never have even occurred to me that that would, that would happen. So, yeah, I still kind of can't believe it. <laughs> well, and so often in talking with other authors, I mean, they tend to fall into two different camps, right? There are the some where it, it is option and it makes it to the screen and they're like, the author's like, hey, I just took the money and I ran. Um, others still have some level of involvement, but you actually were able to be a writer with the first installment of Roswell on TV. So seeing your characters, I mean, and having the input, I mean, the direct input, I mean, you can't get any more direct than being one of the writers on it. I mean, did that help? I mean, was that great? I mean, was it still, you had to make tweaks because they were different from how you pictured the characters? How was that experience? Um, well, I, Laura and I were, went in as a writing team and we only wrote on the third season. So by the time we um, joined the writing staff and we were the junior um, writers, we were the staff writers, um, the story had already gone in a pretty different direction from the books. The very first book and the pilot episode are, are pretty close, um, even like lines of dialogue and it was kind of fun to see how much they, they kept. In fact, they even kept one thing from the original manuscript that my editor took out, which gave me like a little, 
a burst of joy, I guess. I don't know, or just vindication. Um, so by the time season three, the characters, the character basic personalities and pairings were kind of the same, but the story was really different. So um, I remember my agent said to share ideas, but not too much, like don't talk too much, don't talk too little. So I was kind of trying to walk the line of like respecting that it really wasn't my Roswell anymore. It was kind of like an alternate universe. So I was going into a Roswell that was different than the one that, uh, that I had written and find different stories within that. And as a staff writer, Laura and I only wrote one script, but um, the way that Roswell and a lot of shows worked was uh, we usually, all the writers would plot out the scripts together either all together or maybe in two groups and we would go like scene by scene by scene. So we were more part of the brain pool and then we just wrote one episode. Mm -hmm. And then taking it to the reboot where they made even further changes. Cause I know as a viewer, I, and, and a fan of both, I was like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, so now you've got Rosa as the sister who had, was not around. She was a motivating factor in the first series, but she was dead. <laughs> and right. so they brought her back and, and just other changes with the character. I mean, to see it go through yet another revamp. Positive feelings on that? Was it weird? You know, there was such a long span of years since I wrote the books and the sec and the reboot that um, it felt different than the first time. I, the first time I was very aware of all the changes and had more feelings about it all, I think. But with the second one, it was more just like yet another alternate universe. It was kind of like being in the Marvel multiverse kind of. And it was like, I just kind of found it interesting to see what they did. I don't think Rosa, um, she was in the books, like you said, as a motivator for Liz's kind of driven personality, but um, she wasn't even mentioned in the, uh, in the Roswell, first Roswell. So it was interesting to see like some things that kind of got pieced back in. And I was glad to see, I love Sherry Appleby as Liz. Um, I thought she was wonderful, but it was kind of nice to see uh, Liz get to go back to her Hispanic yeah. roots, just being said in Roswell. I know I kept on referring back to Wikipedia and I was like, okay, wait a second. What, how, how did this change? What, what did they do here? <laughs> <laughs> And with all of that, you said that you had, it was a collaboration that you were doing with Laura and you also collaborated with her on several other YA books, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how was that collaboration? How did that normally work between the two of you? Well, Laura and I were editors together before I was, before I wrote Roswell for her. So um, we worked at a book packager. I don't know if everyone's familiar with those. They, um, they usually, um, produce series for publishers, like publishers are the clients, but when they're long running series, um, like Sweet Valley High was one that Laura worked on, um, where they're coming out really frequently and they have to have a high level of continuity. A lot of times they're kind of given to book packagers and Roswell was done at a book packager. Pocketbooks came up with the basic, we want to, basically we want to do a series called Roswell High and then Laura sort of developed it at the packager and then brought me in. But when we wrote together, we would, um, and this is kind of came out of our being editors together because at the packager, you write a lot of outlines and things to give to writers. So we did a lot of that as a team, just, they never really told us to, but that just worked for us. So they just kind of let us do it. And just, um, so we would write the outline together and then we'd, we would divide it in half and we would just all, it would be like, who's writing the first half this time? And we would just have the story laid out and then I would write half and Laura would write half and then we would edit each other. So, and honestly now, if I go back and look at books, I can't remember which part was originally mine or not. I maybe can sometimes remember like, oh, I wrote the first half for that one, but specific scenes or things, it's all a blur because mm -hmm. we just kind of go back and forth so much. So then how was the transition doing that as a collaboration to then writing solo. I really miss Laura. <laughs> in fact, there was one point where I was having kind of a difficult time where my mom was in the hospital and I was just having a really hard time writing and I just threw myself on Laura's mercy, which, you know, we've been friends for a long time. And I was just, please help me just figure out the plot because I'm so stuck and she did. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, it's more fun writing with a partner. Um, 
Laura has three kids and who's very active in local politics. So our schedules didn't always mesh, but um, I miss having that brainstorming. Like I can do it by myself, but I, I honestly, it's not quite as, as fun. Mm -hmm. so. so with that, I mean, have you reached out to other writing groups? I mean, have you altered so that you're, that you're bouncing ideas off of other people or? I really haven't. I think because the schedule is so tight that I almost don't have time to mm -hmm. get feedback from a writing group and implement it. It's um, partly like I work full time at the library. So um, when I was in LA, I was part of a writing group and I really loved it. But I just, not because I can't find one here or there aren't people here that would be great at it. It's just, I feel like by the time I would turn in chapters and maybe get feedback, I'd already have to be so much further along. So I think I just kind of use my editing background to write like a first draft and then I kind of switch over into editor mode and just kind of do it for myself, you know? And then of course, then I have an editor after that. One of the other things that I thought was really interesting is your transition between um, not so much different genres, but really different age groups. I mean, writing for middle grade type books and the YA, and now adult romance. I mean, how, how does your mind kind of transition between those? Is it an easy jump? Do you have to get in the right mood or are there certain limits of like, oh, wait, wait a second, this is more YA, I can't include these things or it is an adult. So you know what, they better make sure that they kiss by page, whatever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Not quite like they need to kiss by a page, certain page, but definitely, you know, writing something for like middle grade that has like a tiny bit of romance versus like kind of some of the YAs more, I don't think any of them had actual like sex scenes in them, but more graphic. And then, you know, and really these ones are probably scenes like this could be in a YA book, but they wouldn't want to read about the characters that are in their thirties, but you know, they could, um, when I started editing, I was an editor at Berkeley and I edited a lot of romance. So I had like a pretty strong romance background as an editor and I've edited mysteries and things. So I think that helped me. And then when I switched to working at Parachute Publishing, then I started working on young adults. So I think being an editor for a variety of genres and a variety of ages kind of helped me have in my head what my targets were sort of. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned the, the earlier series with MacGyver, the, the cat yes. Mac, right? And, and talk to your pa and, and that entire series. But what was the inspiration with the current se series with the Fox Crossing Maine? Um, Gary, again, um, Gary comes up with the titles for all the books. And also, like I said, he came up with the premise for the first one. For the second, for the Fox books, he just said that Fox were popular and he wanted me to do something with the Fox. And I think my basic starting point was I wanted to do an animal that was really different than MacGyver the cat. Um, so I didn't want to do anything that had to, um, well, I didn't, I didn't want the fox to be actively trying to make things happen the way that MacGyver did. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the voice to sound really different than Max. So I kind of just went from there. It's like, what kind of animal, what kind of fox can I give a different kind of voice and a different kind of still being important to the story, but not causing things. So that's when I came up with the legend of the fox being good luck and just kind of went from there. And this latest book, Outfoxed, when I'm reading it, I mean, it's a second chance redemption of, you know, the, one of the main characters. I mean, Redemption stories always seem difficult, right? Because how are you really going to create that arc so people are again rooting for that main character to have that happily ever after? I mean, what are the challenges or, or is it just all smooth sailing for you? No, I think it's, I think that one and also the, the one before that, um, Crazy Like a Fox. I remember talking to a friend and she wasn't sure I'd be able to kind of bring the, the main lead guy character around from being kind of, uh, yeah, not not really a great partner in, in his romances. Um, and this one was especially challenged because, you know, having really, this won't spoil anything since right at the beginning, having a character that was a bully in high school, I mean, bullying is so 
horribly painful. I had like one year of being bullied like in the fifth grade. Um, and then, you know, it like hurts so much. And it's, it's, I guess for me, the redemption had to come from like, okay, well, what, what makes somebody a bully? What's going on in their life? Nobody just wakes up and decides it would be fun. I don't think many people, at least nobody that I would want to write about them. So it was kind of finding what motivated him back then and trying to find a way from, from him just being kind of like, oh, I kind of vaguely remember that I did that, but it was no big thing. It was just a joke to kind of realizing that it wasn't to the people involved to kind of working his way through it. So yeah, it's not exactly smooth. I have to figure it out for myself, like how I can, how I can deal with them, how it can be okay for me. And then I can kind of try and make it okay. And, and that was one of the things for me, it was so topical because like you said, they're older characters. So you know, in their thirties and my high school reunion is coming up this year and I'm already texting with friends and they're like, oh my gosh, looking forward to it, but all the drama and the people, and, <laughs> you know, but being able to show that people have grown, I think also comes across in this story, right? Yeah, I guess it's just, it depends on the reader if it works for them or not, if they feel like he was redeemed enough to warrant being a kind of romance hero or not. And what about the challenges of incorporating animals into the story? Because again, like you said, the fox here is different from Mac in the previous series. And we're always suckers when authors put the animals into their stories and their books. But we're always curious as to... I mean, what are the the easy aspects of that? Or, or is it a different level of challenge because it's almost a completely different character? Yeah, it's kind of like creating any character almost. Like for Mac the cat, it was kind of figuring out what his point of view was. And when I started thinking that he just kind of thought of humans as sort of unable to take care of themselves and handle their own lives, then it kind of gave me an end for his his voice. And I had fun writing the Mac point of view. I had a harder time writing the Fox point of view, honestly. I kept, I think in the first book, I didn't write them until the end because I just couldn't figure it out. And then eventually it's like, I had to turn it in. So I was like, all right, you just got to do it, find something. But I never, it wasn't as easy and in as the, as the Mac voice. Mm -hmm. I think because he was stealing things and everything, it just kind of just already felt like that. And I'm an animal lover. I mean, I've always, I don't have an animal right now, but almost always I do, so. <laughs> I said we're always suckers for it in any type of book with the animals we tend to pick them up and it's like okay and the animal on the cover is usually the selling point so. yeah honestly I have to give the that great cat face on the very first MacGyver book I think almost full credit for any sales that it had because it just I think you just see that cute cat face and you're like I just want to pick it up. It's, right. It's cat. <laughs> so again, it's like the art department and Gary together, I feel like had a huge amount to do with, with that book getting out there. Well, Melinda, I want to switch over to what we call our fresh fiction facts. Okay. These are some quick, basic questions. There's no right or wrong answer to them, but kind of just what comes to the top of your head. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. What is your favorite time of day? to write? Um, it used to be late at night, but now it's more at the beginning of the day. Like on, I don't write on the days that I work, even though I work full time. So I kind of just write on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, so I kind of write long days on the weekends, but I like to get started early. Cause if I, I just feel like I find it harder to switch gears, I guess if I do other things first so what is your favorite writing fuel I think like green tea I, I go to Starbucks a lot and write at Starbucks I used to go to this indie coffee place but it closed so not that there's anything wrong with Starbucks like I like to get out of the house I find it even though I live by myself I find it distracting to be at home mm -hmm. who was your first book boyfriend or girlfriend Wow. You know, the first thing that comes to my head is Calvin from A Wrinkle in Time. Oh, wow. Okay. Awesome. I love that character. What is one luxury item or unnecessary product that you just absolutely can't live without? <laughs> this isn't really a luxury item, but it's, again, it's the first thing that came to my head is like 
the movies. I go to the movies all the time. I couldn't live without actually going to the theater. I, it was very hard during the pandemic not to be able to go into the theater. I like to sit in the dark and not have any distractions and have my field of vision full. <laughs> what movie, what movie is it that everyone else thinks is just a terrible movie, but you absolutely love? I've seen Grease too an embarrassing amount of times. Cool Rider, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people really even have seen it or would admit to even knowing a song from it. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, no, I, I can sing along to pretty much <laughs> every song and probably recite the script back to yes <laughs> yes because you, you I mean yeah it was Greece Greece too I mean that's I'm with you on that one okay <laughs> <laughs> with whom would you want to be stuck in an elevator right I do I am just kind of going off the top of my head I would like to be stuck in in the elevator with Laura because I really miss hanging out with her and working with her it's uh we we were like writing partners and friends for such a long time and we're still friends but um you know first we were in new york together and then we moved to la at the same time and then but now she's in long island and i'm in north carolina so um yeah it would be fun to catch up to have like time where it was just, just like forced to 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 catch up instead of trying to figure out like a time that it would work okay i'm gonna make this question a little bit harder oh, okay so, other than laura <laughs> Who would be your dream writer collaboration? Oh, uh, well, you know, there are many amazing writers, but this sounds, sounds so strange though. I, I think it would be really hard for me to write with someone else. It's such, the chemistry is so, um, it's so rare. Like I have friends who are writers and I have writers that I love their work, but, um, I've never really felt like I could write with somebody else, you know, just, I don't know. And I haven't really wanted to find another writing partner. Um, wow, okay. It was just kind of by chance that we just found that when we were writing these outlines that we were really in sync. And I think, mm -hmm. I think it's really rare to be able to like each write half a book and actually put it together. Um, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't think it would be very easy to actually find, even though- And then I, to have it so seamless, like you said, where- yeah. Yeah, and especially like we could write middle grade together and then write young adult together. And I think because maybe because we both had different editing experience and also editing series where multiple writers, like one of the series I worked on was like full one of the Full House Michelle books or something. But so multiple writers, but they always have to sound the same. So I think maybe Laura and I are both adept at um, mimicking other voices. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, maybe that made us kind of a unique partnership in that way. Like we both had experience so you can try to sound like other people. What is something or one thing that can instantly pull you out of a story, either while you're watching a movie or reading a book? Uh, it's the, for romance for me, it's the kind of the, the, the kind of story where if one character just asked one basic question, it would all be solved. You know, that kind of misunderstanding that that really would take nothing to to resolve. Um, I always find that frustrating. It's kind of I, don't, I just want more more of mm -hmm. a deeper reason that that they can't get together right away. Mm -hmm. What is the most unexpected piece of advice that you've ever received? of writing advice? Any type of advice even. Any type of advice. Unexpected. Hmm, I can't think of anything. I don't know why, I'm just totally blanking. <laughs> Sorry. That is okay, don't worry. We always try to come up with at least one to stump people. <laughs> What movies, kind of along the same question as earlier, but what movies can you watch multiple times and still enjoy? Um, I like a lot of the kind of 
classic romantic comedies, even from from like the Philadelphia story to like Bridget Jones Diary or um, When Harry Met Sally. I mean, I, those are ones I can watch again and again. I also really like horror. So like I watched like Carrie a bunch of times, you know. So. <laughs> a full range there, yes. <laughs> yes, maybe that's why I can switch genres too. <laughs> Um, what is your favorite one hit wonder? Hmm. One hit wonder. <laughs> Maybe it's just been a long day. My mind is blanking. <laughs> I just, I'm so, I really can't do oh, no. anything. I'm so sorry. No, we've got lots of questions. Don't worry. Um, how about if somebody looked under your bed, what would they find? Probably like an empty Diet Pepsi bottle that's rolled under there and just <laughs> fluff and things. N nothing interesting, but definitely not very clean under there, I don't think. <laughs> things that I can't reach. <laughs> I can relate to that, yes. <laughs> What's the most unnecessary thing that you've ever bought online? Oh, wow, well, let's see. I used to go to this site called stupid.com. So everything there was completely unnecessary, but I just, you know, like I bought, it wasn't, an, it was unnecessary, but for some reason they were selling soles of shoes that were first like Grateful Dead sneakers and they had bones on the, on the soles, but they weren't with shoes. It was just the soles. Maybe they just never finished making them or something, but my brother was a huge Grateful Dead fan, so I bought it for him. And he actually like drilled holes in them and made flip flops out of them. And he loved them so much. So it really wasn't unnecessary, I guess. But I bought so many things from that site and all of them were stupid. <laughs> but in a Oh, way. wow. <laughs> <laughs> How do you celebrate after a new release? You know what? I need to get back into doing that. Um, I don't really. Oh, Melinda, come on. I know, I know, I should. I don't know. I think like everybody, it's just been a hard couple of years. I feel right. like I just feel a sense of relief, but not like, all right, so you'll inspire me. So after the next one, I'll find something to do to celebrate because <laughs> I, I like, I do enjoy writing. It's just the last couple of years, it's, like with everybody, with all aspects of life, it's just been harder, you know? Yes, definitely so. understand that. And kind of a double whammy also mean not only the celebration of this last release, but this was the completion. I mean, this was the last book in the series, right? Yeah. Or are you planning more? No, I, I've moved on. Dogs are my personal favorite. So I, I've now, Gary has, has um, let me go move on to dogs for the next one. So. Okay, can you give us a hint of what kind of dog? Um, it's a puppy. Okay, <laughs> this is like an inside story of publishing, which I hope they don't care that I tell. So I had a dog that was a Sharpay mix, like maybe a lab Sharpay mix. And he had that beautiful wrinkly face and those little oh, yeah. tiny ears. And I thought he was so adorable. <laughs> so Gary said, what is the dog in the book like? <laughs> and so I sent a picture of my dog, my dog at the time. <laughs> and he wrote me back and he's like, oh, Lord, Mel, tell me that's not the dog from the book. <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, what is it? And I said, it's a Sharpay mix. <laughs> and he said, that sounds like something you'd order at a Thai restaurant. <laughs> So I said, you can have whatever kind of dog you want, um, but it needs to be medium to large. And then he sent me a picture of what was clearly a puppy. And he said, it's a little smaller than what we talked about. And I was like, it's not smaller. It's also a puppy. And I said adult too. So it's a puppy. And it looks kind of like a Jack Russell mix, maybe. Um, but I, I have to say, I really do trust Gary in terms of his instincts for what kind of like the cat on the cat books didn't look like the cat I described initially either. So I feel like he has a good eye. He has, he's the one who comes up, like I said, with the titles. And I feel like, although I found my dog incredibly 
cute, but maybe he was an acquired taste. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So to me, maybe he'll always be a little bit that dog and I just will modify him. You know. Yeah. Because a Sharpay, Jack Terrier, definitely different. Yes. Definitely different. I thought the char- the wrinkles were just like great character. And he always looked like he was smiling to me. One of those, maybe that was the lab part of him and how they sort of had that open mouth kind of. Anyway, that's the my inside story of um, <laughs> of the inner workings of publishing sometimes. But again, I I really trust Gary and Kensington. So that is not really a complaint. It's just a story of how, how things work. Also, I thought it was funny, the Thai restaurant comment, even though I was like, no, he's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with that insight, where can readers stay in touch with you and find out more about you in future releases? All right, this is again, this is this is really an area that I completely fall down on. I am so bad at doing that kind of promotion and I should be, I should, I need, I need to be better. I think it's just, I think it's other writers manage to do it, but for me somehow working full-time and then writing the books, I just kind of fall down on that. I guess Facebook is the best mm-hmm. place. Laura was, God, I talked about Laura a lot in this conversation, but she, she was good about like more <laughs> trying to get us to, you know, it's like, although we would both, she would, she wasn't, we together we weren't the best at it either, but periodically she would be like, we suck, we have to tweet. And then it would be like, we would do it for a few weeks and then it would just, but I really, I. That's something I have to work on. Well, I got a copy of Outfox because it was included in our Fresh Fiction subscription box oh. that we sent out to our readers. Um, and so that was our monthly, one of our uh, books for our monthly box in uh, January. So oh, that's cool. So it gets out there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that if the, if any publicity people watch this from Kensington, they'll be like, oh no, she's, she's a mess. <laughs> Well, this is a great way to also introduce yourself to other readers because we will have this posted on YouTube. And with that, that kind of brings our recorded portion of the evening to a close. So I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And we will head over to the after uh, our happy hour so that we can get some questions from our other readers that are attending. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank-